Double Identity, Chapter 10. Before she leaves, Merle shows me how the TV works and how to download movies on her cable system. She looks up the number for the grocery store and writes it down in big fat numbers on a pad of paper beside the phone. She apologizes for being probably the last person in America who doesn't have a cell phone. She asks me at least six times, now you're sure you'll be okay by yourself. If you need me for anything, anything at all, just call the grocery store and have me paged. Sure, I say, I'll be fine. And then Merle's gone and the house is dead silent. I stand at the window watching her blue car disappear from sight and I feel abandoned once again. I stumble back and sit on the couch and listen for a sound, any sound. The hum of the refrigerator, the tick of a clock, the breathing of the furnace, there's nothing. This is something else strange about me, which I never would have admitted to Merle or anyone else, but here I am, 12 going on 13, and I have never once been alone. Oh sure, sometimes I've gone to my room and shut the door, shutting my parents out, but even then, I always knew they were in the house, just the other side of the wall, within earshot. Way back in third grade, I started hearing from other kids at school how they got themselves out the door in the morning an hour or two after their parents left for work. How they went home to an empty house and popped microwave popcorn and watched TV cartoons and didn't even touch their homework until their parents straggled in the door. By third grade, I had the sense not to ask for this treat for myself. My mother would have popped microwave popcorn for me. She would have turned the TV to the right station long before I got home from school. She would have sat on the couch with me, pretending to be just as interested as I was in Rugrats and SpongeBob SquarePants and Diva Girls. The wind blows outside the tree branches, scratch against the house, and I jump half a foot off the couch. I start thinking of those old third grade classmates of mine as incredibly brave, not incredibly privileged. Stop it, I say aloud. You're almost 13 years old and you're perfectly safe. Isn't that why your father left you here? My voice sounds quivery and terrified. I reach for the TV remote, hoping for some movie I can drown my cowardice in for the next hour and a half. I hear a rustling sound and I jump again, but it's just the newspaper Merle was reading earlier, the Sanderfield reporter sliding down to the ground. You know there could be a whole article in there about Elizabeth and you wouldn't even know it because you're such a chicken, I goad myself. I don't really believe there's anything about Elizabeth in the newspaper, but I pick it up anyway and start reading. The front page is all about the president's last speech and some embezzler in Chicago who's getting out of prison. Further in, I have my choice of reading about a PTO pancake breakfast or a street improvement project. Guess someone forgot to tell the Sanderfield reporter that much more interesting things are happening in my life right now, right here under their noses, I say. I'm really beginning to annoy myself with this talking out loud. It's probably an early sign of mental illness. Like moms, I think this rather than saying it, but that's hardly comforting. I turn another page of the paper and my eyes light on a photo of dozen women posing behind a swath of flowers. Sanderfield Ladies Club spruces up courthouse lawn is the caption and Merle's face floats fuzzily in the back row of the picture. But my eyes focus on what's behind her and the other women, the stone memorial. For someone who died a long time ago, Merle had said, looking stricken before we got to the why, before Tammy mistook me for someone she'd known years ago, when she was my age, before Tammy looked like she'd seen a ghost. The way Tammy and Merle acted, I'm pretty sure Elizabeth is dead. And the woman in the front desk of the Y, whose little boy was born before she moved here, didn't seem to notice anything unusual about my appearance. So probably Elizabeth, Elizabeth died a long time ago. What if Elizabeth was the person memorialized on the plaque? What if the plaque had her full name on it, first and last? If I just got a glimpse of that plaque, maybe the birth and death dates for good measure. I could use Merle's computer. Surely she had a computer crank up the search engine and find out everything I wanted to know. I wouldn't need Merle to break her promise. I wouldn't need my dad to decide if it was safe to tell me the truth. I just need to walk to the courthouse by myself, now before Merle comes back. I don't move. It's not really that I'm scared. What's there to be frightened of? Walking a few blocks to tiny Sanderfield, Illinois, in broad daylight on a crisp October afternoon. 
I don't know, I mutter. And that's the problem. I feel like I'm trying to put a thousand piece jigsaw puzzle together with all but two or three of the pieces turned upside down. Maybe there is something to be afraid of if dad said I'd be safe at Merley's house. Will I still be safe for four or five blocks away? From the time I was a little girl, I've hated sitting still, doing nothing. It's that finally that people tells me off the couch. I just decided to take a walk, get some air, I say, practicing excuses in case Merle comes home and catches me gone. I even write her a note on the tablet at the phone, under the grocery store's number. Be right back. B. After all, it's not like she told me I couldn't go anywhere. My heart's pounding like I'm doing something horribly forbid forbidden, but I try to ignore it. I also pretend to myself that it's perfectly normal to zip my windbreaker up to the very top, twill my hood so it covers my hair and most of my face. I step outside, latching the door behind me, but not locking it. And this too, I try to defend. People leave their doors unlocked all the time in small towns, don't they? A stiff breeze hits me in the face and I tell myself it's bracing, steadying. I take deep breaths and make it to the end of the block. Nobody's out walking except me and I feel horribly visible to all the cars driving by. I hunch over, keep my head down. I turn right, then left, wait at a traffic light, and go straight. And somehow, fighting fear and panic, and a slight sense that what I was doing is ridiculous, I reach the courthouse square. My legs start shaking as I climb two concrete steps towards the memorial. The writing on the plaque is in fancy script that's not easy to read, but even with all the frills and flourishes, even from six feet away, I can tell. The first name's not long enough. It's Thomas, not Elizabeth. Brilliant work, Nancy Drew, I think and disgust. You're so egotistical. Why would a plaque on a stone in Sanderfield, Illinois, have anything to do with you? I read the rest of the plaque anyhow. In memory of Thomas Wilker, a good man and great mayor, 1949 to 1991. Wilker, I think. Thomas Wilker. Merle Wilker. Is that her father? Grandfather? I remember that Wilker is probably Merle's married name. People at the Y called her Mrs. I drew the math. This Thomas Wilker is 42 when he died, some 20 years ago. Merle is probably in her late 50s or early 60s. She and Thomas would have been the same age. I've got no proof, but I'm certain. This plaque is a memorial to Merle's husband. Chapter 11 I walk back to Merle's house, leaves crunching under my feet. I feel like I'm stepping on carcasses. It's too much, I think. Mom crying and Dad being worried and me looking like some girl who's probably dead and no one telling me anything. And Merle's husband dying. I know it's strange to act like Merle's newly widowed, but that's how I feel because I just found out about it. I pass the house that Merle said Abraham Lincoln slept in once, and somehow that seems unbearably sad too. When he was in Sanderfield, Lincoln didn't know he was going to be assassinated. He didn't know almost all the young men in town were going to go off and die in the war. He didn't even know there was going to be a war. I'm doing what I used to do when I was a little girl, and Mom would start crying, spiraling down. We'd be sitting on the couch, and Mom would be reading one of my favorite books. To me. Mrs. Piggly Wiggle, maybe, or Madeline or Pippi Longstocking, and Mom's voice would start sounding thick. I'd look up and Mom would have tears streaming down her face, and I'd feel those tears tugging at me. Pretty soon I'd be crying too, and Mom would start comforting me. There, there, everything's all right. You've got Mommy, I've got you. I think maybe that's why the homeschooling ended. Because my father came home from work and found the two of us crying on the couch together. But I don't know why mom cried only every once in a while then. And cries all the time now. I don't know when I learned how to separate. So I could watch mom crying her heart out and feel absolutely positively nothing. I wish I could separate myself from my sadness now. Why should I care that Merle's husband died 20 years ago? Why should I feel anything for Merle whom I didn't even meet until yesterday? Because she's nice, I think. Because she cares about me. Because she's all I've got right now. I let myself in the front door at Merle's house and tear up the note I left for her. Then I plop down in front of the TV and try to lose myself in some stupid movie 
about jewel thieves making one last heist. That's what I'm watching when Marley gets home. Hi, I grunt. I know I could jump up and offer to help her carry in the groceries. I could ask her about her husband. As far as I know, he is not a forbidden topic. But I don't do either of those things. I just stare at unrealistic car chases flickering before my eyes. Somehow Merle and I get through the rest of the day. I watch TV. She cooks up a sumptuous dinner of chicken, stuffing, and peas, and those little baby onions that I love, but I'm pretty sure I didn't mention to Merle. It doesn't matter. I can't make myself choke down more than a bite or two of anything. I'm really tired. I think I'll just go to bed now, I tell Merle. Merle glances at the pile of dishes in the sink, but all she says is okay. I climb the stairs alone. After I brushed my teeth and turned out the light and crawled into bed, I lay in the darkness telling myself, Daddy will call in the morning. He will. He'll call you. Daddy will call in the morning. As mantras go, it's not terribly comforting. And as it turns out, it's not exactly accurate. Dad doesn't call me. Mom does. Chapter 12. The phone rings in the middle of the night. I'm running to answer it before I quite remember where I am. I crash into the wall trying to find the door. I trip on the bottom two stair steps. Still, I reach the kitchen long before Merle. Hello, I gasp out of breath. Elizabeth, it's my mother's voice, but my mother's voice with a difference. She's not crying. Elizabeth, I'm so glad I reached you. I know you're spending the night with Joss, but I just had the worst dream and I wanted to make sure. Mom, this is Bethany, I say. Mom actually laughs. Oh, is that the name you're trying out this week? Enough already. Listen, Elizabeth, I know you were counting on going to Sinclair Mountain for your birthday, but I don't think it's a good idea. This dream I had. Well, let's just say it'd be better if you stayed home. We could rent some videos, have a party. Mom, it's Bethany, I say. I have chills traveling up my spine. Quit fooling around, Elizabeth. I'm serious. I know you're disappointed about Sinclair Mountain, but believe me, this is for the best. In the background, I hear a kind of grunt and my father saying drowsily, Hillary, who are you talking to? Elizabeth, my mom says. Her next words are muffled, as if she's put her hand over the phone. I just had to call her. I had this horrible dream about her birthday at Sinclair Mountain, and it was all so real. I hear a chunkling sound, as if the phone has fallen to the floor. Then my father's voice, louder than before. He's talking directly into the receiver now. Hello? Daddy, I say. Bethany, even though he sounds a little uncertain about my identity. Daddy, what's going on? What's mom talking about? Who's Elizabeth? Why doesn't mom know who I am? I can hear my father taking a ragged breath as my mother shouts in the background. Walter, give me that phone. I have to talk to her. I don't want her to die. The die fades away into a wail and then sobs. Daddy, I say again. Hillary, stop. You're upsetting Bethany. Remember Bethany? My father's voice is a distant rumble. Then he's back on the phone. Your mother had a bad reaction to some medication. That's all. She's hallucinating. No, she's not, I say. I'm sure my father can hear me. Over my mother's sobbing, and somehow this emboldens me. Elizabeth was real, wasn't she? And I looked like her. Who was she? Did she die? For a moment, all I can hear is my mother sobbing. Then my father whispers into the phone. Yes. Yes what, I say. Yes, she's real. Yes, she's dead. Yes, I look like her. We didn't think we'd have to tell you, my father says. His voice is still barely more than a whisper. I press the phone so tightly against my ear that I can hear my own pulse echoing in the receiver. And behind my pulse, the rest of his words. We didn't want you to be upset. Upset, I repeat. Didn't you think I'd be upset wondering why mom cries all the time? Didn't you think I'd be upset getting dropped off with some relative I've never even heard of? while you and mom are God knows where. One of my teachers back in Pennsylvania, Mr. Caffey always quoted at us, you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. It's from the Bible or somewhere. I don't know anything resembling the truth about Elizabeth yet, but it sure feels wonderful to speak the truth. It's liberating. Suddenly I love shouting at my father. Yes, I don't know, my father says, and he sounds so old and defeated. I stop feeling so wonderful. Ask, ask Merle. Merle can tell you about Elizabeth. She's allowed to. I feel cruel pressing this point, like a lawyer badgering a distraught witness on the stand. But I've come so far. I don't want permission snatched away from me at the last minute. 
I can picture Merle shaking her head at me, saying, Well, maybe your father told you I was allowed to tell you, but he didn't tell me. It'd be like the little kid game, losing at the very end because you didn't say, Mother, may I? My father sighs, a heavy pain. I'm not sure I can survive this sigh. Let me talk to Merle, he says. I look around and she's right there, leaning against the counter in her red fuzzy robe. Her white hair tussled, her face creased with concern. I don't know how long she's been there or how much she's heard, but I hand her the phone. Walter, she says, and listens, and listens. Finally, she says, I can do that. Take care of Hillary, and hangs up. The phone's in its cradle, and Merle turns to face me. My heart pounds hard against my chest, although I just swam the hardest practice of my life. What have I gotten myself into? I dread the words that Merle is about to say. She opens her mouth. She speaks. I hear her voice as if I'm drowning, and she's far away on shore. Elizabeth, she says, was your sister. I pull back. I'm drowning for sure. I'm an only child, I say. Merle puts her hand on top of mine, on top of the counter, holding on to me. So was Elizabeth, she says.